Okay, welcome everybody to our DMM community live session today. It's the first one we've had for a long time, so I'm sure you've all been eager to come back and talk about the DMM. So it's fantastic to have you here. And we're really, really excited that tonight we have four speakers who are all talking about something very interesting indeed. So we have names that may be familiar to you or may not be, and that is Clark Bain, Lydia Guthrie, Sabinda Kaur Bogal, and Ezra Lowe. And they are speaking today about their new book, which is Attachment-Based Practice with Children, Adolescents, and Families. For many of you, you would have read Clark's original book, which he wrote with Toni Morrison, which was Attachment-Based Practice with Adults. And this is in some ways a follow-up to that. And I'm not going to say much about it because they will talk about it themselves. But it's great to have everybody here. And I'm going to hand over, first of all, to Lydia. And Lydia is going to start the presentation. Welcome, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, when we planned uh, our presentation today, um, as a systemic therapist, uh, my first thought was uh, not to talk, not to begin by talking directly about the book, but to talk about the process and the relationships out of which the book was born. Um, so I, I've got that job, uh, which is a real pleasure. Next slide, please, Clark. Um, so these are the two books side by side. Uh, you'll see that the Blue Book, published in 2011, uh, written by Clark and Toni Morrison, uh, was attachment-based practice with adults, which many of you will be familiar with. Um, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the, uh, the work and life of Toni Morrison, whose, whose spirit and mind live on in the work of everyone who, who knew him uh, and, and certainly live on uh, into our new book. Um, so the, the Pale Green book uh, is, is the one that has just been published uh, earlier this year and is a companion volume, very much a sister volume with attachment-based practice with adults. The, they're both published by Pavilion Publishing um, and crucially the illustrations um, were all done by Joe Hathaway, who also edited uh, our most recent book as well. So we just need, we should take a moment to acknowledge her, her greatness and her wonderful illustrations, which we think add so much to the book. Um, so next slide, please, Clark. Um, the book is very much written as a group. It's, it's a book about relationships, which is born out of close professional relationships, which have become friendships. Um, and Sati wrote these wonderful words as the acknowledgements. Um, when I was thinking about putting this part of the presentation together, I realised that I really couldn't improve on them. So if you'll bear with me, I'll just read this short section of the, the acknowledgements. Um, At the heart of each one of us is the connectedness that exists between us. As we write these acknowledgements, our working relationships and our passion for using the dynamic maturational model of attachment and adaptation, hereafter known as the DMM, in our work, allow us to write as a collective. As authors, we are from different cultural and racial backgrounds, and we also differ in our professional roles. The DMM is where we find common ground. The model applies to many disciplines and across cultures, and we have each found multiple uses and practical value in the way the DMM enhances our self-understanding and our professional roles. We would like to thank our nearest and dearest, without whom none of us would have been able to understand our own attachment strategies and use this as the basis of our continued learning. Our relational anchors and allies all continue to hopefully get the best of us as we continue to learn. Um, and on that note, mm -hmm. hi, mum. My mum's in the room as well. So, <laughs> hi, mum. So next slide, please, Club. So um, all, uh, all family therapists like a good timeline and family tree. So here's, here's the kind of timeline and family tree of this book. Um, to say a little about each of the four of us, I'll, I'll just very briefly mention our professional roles. Um, so uh, Ezra is a consultant uh, child and adolescent psychiatrist. Uh, Sati is a clinical psychologist. Clark is a psychodrama psychotherapist and a DMM trainer. Um, and I'm originally qualified as a social worker, um, but now I work as a family therapist or systemic psychotherapist. 
And between us, we've worked in child settings, adult settings, and forensic settings. So we have a very broad base of, of uh, disciplines, trainings, and uh, practical experience. So in 2000, uh, Clark thinks it was 1999, I think it was 2000, so we're, we're, not, we're, not, we're not quite sure, but we're, we're not going to split hairs. Um, Clark and I met at a criminal justice conference in the Lake District in the UK, where Clark was presenting a paper about working with people who deny their offences. Um, we got chatting and then we met a few years later when Clark uh, trained me on the probation services sex offender group work programs. After that, we became close colleagues and business partners and have, have run hundreds of training courses and written books together before. Um, so that, that was the kind of the very beginning. Um, and then later in 2010, uh, by random chance, um, Ezra and I were sitting next to each other in a conference room in Manchester in the UK um, at a five-day attachment and psychopathology course presented by Dr. Patricia Crittenden. Um, it was a fabulous course. It was mind expanding and I still draw on the learning. Parts of the course were also challenging and uh, Dr. Crittenden had just presented uh, a, a, an aspect of the work which I found quite emotionally challenging. Um, and when it came to the break, Ezra and I turned to each other. We were both there individually, not knowing anybody else. We turned to each other and went, whew, that's going to take some thinking about. Um, and then we went and joined the TQ uh, to get ourselves some refreshments. And we hit it off and began talking um, completely by random chance. Um, a few months later, Ezra uh, being uh, a person of action, uh, invited Clark and I to present an introduction to the DMM for his colleagues at the Birmingham Mental Health Trust. Um, we presented a, uh, um, a day's introduction to the DMM to a room full of, uh, of uh, mental health professionals, uh, which Ezra kindly organized. Um, he'd invited his good friend and colleague, Sati, who was in the audience. Um, who was really captivated by the ideas in the DMM and came up to ask some questions of me at the end of the day. Um, and Sati and I struck up a conversation um, and enjoyed speaking with each other. Um, and over the next few years, as a group of four, we ran several short training courses and, and held regular meetings as a group. Until somebody said, hey, folks, we should probably write a book. Um, and Pavilion were very, very keen to have a, a, a companion volume to attachment-based practice with adults. So, so they were very supportive of this idea. So that's kind of the timeline of how the book came along. Next slide, please, Clark. Um, and our experience of writing the book as a group um, it, it, is that it's, it's, it's been really embedded in these themes, themes of sharing stories and narratives, both as from our own lives, our family experiences, the deepening connections and relationships with each other, which have also informed our approach to working with young people and families and vice versa. Um, it's taken us a, a long time to write this book and, and partly that's because of different challenges and pressures which we each faced in our professional and personal lives in addition to a global pandemic. Um, and and through, the, through that six years, we have supported each other uh, as individuals um, in, in, a, in a really profound way, I think. Um, we've working across and between professional disciplines has has really required us to adopt approach of humility and curiosity, which we hope is infused within the book. Um, and as I said earlier, it's a book about relationships, which has emerged within and from developing relationships between us as an author group. I'm really minded, uh, reminded of the words of the, the fabulous therapist, Vicki Reynolds, who writes about the importance of finding your tribe. Everyone needs a group of people who you can sit around the fire with and howl at the moon. I think she's talking metaphorically, uh, maybe not, um, but, but I've certainly found my tribe here. We've done lots of howling at the moon together. So next slide, please, Clark. And the writing process, um, it, it's taken the, the shape of sitting together in clinical rooms in Birmingham, NHS mental health settings up and, you know, all over Birmingham, usually eating biscuits and drinking tea, sharing ideas, uh, sharing snippets and vignettes and narratives um, and, and thinking about how they might be uh, woven into a book. Um, being through this, it became clear to us that narratives and stories would be the central feature of the book. Um, and you'll hear more about those later. 
Um, also keeping a good eye on the variety of sources of danger, the themes and diverse ent identities which we wanted to be represented in the book. We then shared out the case studies between us according to our passions and interests and our expertise. Each individual then wrote drafts of the chapters and revised it on the basis of feedback from the wider team. Um, we then had this extra additional step, which was, which was really fascinating, which was liaising with Joe Hathaway, the illustrator, where we had to be very clear about describing our, our intentions for the story um, and making the revision. Seeing how Joe had interpreted our words um, were, really added an extra layer of complexity to the book, um, and we hope richness. Who doesn't love a book with pictures? Um, so that's uh, some, some of the really important themes and processes in the writing process. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Sati, who will be speaking about um, formulation and assessment. Thank you, Lydia. Um, as I was sitting here listening to you, it still makes me all warm um, just talking about our story. So thank you for the reminder. I should carry it through for this evening with some more biscuits, maybe. So thank you. Um, and thank you, Clark, for sharing the slides. So I'm going to be talking a bit about... Um, Three chapters really around assessment, formulation, and treatment. Um, together, there was something about you know, with any professional group, um, formulation is key across all disciplines. And what we wanted was a real practical go to guide, irrespective of your skills, your knowledge, or your experience, something that people can find in a tangible form and use within their day to day practical work. I guess many on the Zoom today are from really pressurized services, so we know that actually people just like the actually what would be helpful for us with families that we might be working with. Um, I think it's important to share that I am a clinical psychologist and one of the key things about being a clinical psychologist is around formulation. Um, my experience is, um, is that my background is within child protection and children in care settings. I was formerly a social work assistant and then I trained to become a clinical psychologist where I'm sure everyone's familiar on the Zoom. Formulation and assessments are really key. But what I saw in my professional practice, and again, it's only my professional practice, was many reports and assessments that either they were lacking um, what was really needed to understand children and families and some of the difficulties they were going through, or we had a lot of assessments that really told us nothing. And all we were doing was repeated assessments over time, and they weren't helpful. Most importantly, they were actually more harmful to the children and families and on services as well. Um, so really, as I'm going to explain um, the next three chapters, it's really around the experiences of helping professional groups um, navigate assessment and formulation, working within whatever child and family setting that you might be working with, whether, whether it's a local authority um, setting or mental health um, service setting as well. So the way that we understand formulation is just a shared understanding of what might be going on with an individual um, relating to social, psychological, cultural, racial, biological factors. Um, and so the next slide that I'm gonna present is a real way to understand integration and using um, the word integration in our work. Thank you, Clark, um, next slide already done. Um, so this slide, um, integration throughout the but the whole book is key. Um, we use an intuitive approach to assessment, treatment and intervention, drawing on a range of theories and models in order to really promote a flexible approach. So it doesn't matter whether you're a social worker, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, um, an art therapist, um, a support worker. We need to think is actually how can we use integration um, in our thinking, in our models, uh, and in a way of working just to help children and families that we might be working with. And we've written in the book five levels of intervention, which may be seen as like a template to, um, to people that they can use um, as part of their assessments. And I guess by exploring biology, neurology, psychology, relationships and context, it really helps to pull in a lot of information that helps to make sense of what treatment is really needed for children and families at any given point um, in, their, in their life. Um, as well. And so there's a lot of emphasis in chapter four around biopsychosocial formulation, as seen here, and what we can do to help people um, make sense of the difficulties that children and families might be going through as well. So over to the, the next slide. Thank you, Clark. Um, just to give you a bit of snippet as to what to expect in chapter five. Again, for purposes of time, I won't have the luxury of going through each one of the the things that we explore in chapter five, but I'm going to go through a few and that would be a helpful guide. Um, 
So here we have principles of attachment-based practice um, and a few that might be helpful in our day-to-day -day work as well. Um, I work with children and families who experience complex trauma um, and I found these really helpful as guiding teens, services and individuals um, who are working with children and families as well. At the moment, we know that you know, services are stretched and there's a lot of problem-focused talk um, and pressures on services. And what we love about this chapter is actually we focus on key principles of creating what we call trauma-informed care, which is really around focusing on strength. So thinking about adaptation, not disorder highlighting what care and compassion actually means and understanding self-protective strategies that children, parents and families might be um, using um, and really trying to make sense of them so they're not um, pathologizing in any way as well. There's a whole debate at the moment around diagnosis and we're not going to get into that. What we will um, highlight is the importance of actually seeing, seeing people as individuals, so not just having a one-size-fits-all approach, but really treating people and not diagnosis helping people understand what might be driving them to experience processes that lead them to experience depression, anxiety, trauma, and so forth as well. Um, and we do this by understanding how their past influences their present, um, becoming more conscious and aware of self-protective strategies, and actually allowing them to help explore and think about how they're functioning um, in more integrated ways, both internally and um, externally as well. Um, there's also a whole emphasis on a family approach um, as well. Um, again, as I've shared, I work in mental health services at the moment, where often the driving force of change is often the children. So we have therapy waiting lists or waiting lists of people waiting for therapy. And what we have um, are people coming back, you know, and what we're not looking at is the whole system, the whole family. And this chapter is really around making sense our family-based formulations, um, and actually thinking about the services that we work in as well. Um, so yeah, so we've got a whole chapter um, on functional family um, formulations as well. Um, so next slide, please, Clark. And the final chapter, um, it's really around um, a practical guide for practitioners and teams and services to really use to really create maybe cohesion, structure um, in the work that you might be delivering. Again, it doesn't matter whether you're mental health or social care or adoption, it really will help provide a framework to think about and explore. Um, we know that actually at the moment, there's a lot of conversations happening around harm by professionals and services. And I think what this chapter does is, is raise the, it's talk about the elephant in the room really which is around harm that we can actually cause to children and families by not actually paying attention to the support that we might need in working in pressurized services so the importance of supervision self-reflection teamwork um, support that we might need in working with the systems that we, we are working in as well so there's a lot of um, work around um, helpful tool toolkits that could use in supervision or within teams as well What's really key about this chapter is around actually the importance of co-produced formulations. So again, not doing to children and families and making sure that we're working with children and families to really help them, that we need to have a working relationship with them for any change to happen. We know that from all the literature that we have. And this chapter really talks about co-producing formulations in a way that's not just with children and families, but with other professional groups and other agencies as well, so that we can help children and families continue um, what was really helpful for me in this chapter is breaking down problems in smaller steps and helping children and families just navigate through what's doable at this particular moment, at this particular time, with what resources or protective factors they might have. And a lot of this chapter is around the importance of just treatment planning in a way that's more helpful to not only the service, but most importantly to children and families as well. So, yeah, and so what we focus on is various things, for example, um, the families and experiences of danger in the past. And when I mean family, it could be the child and the parent and other people within the system as well. We focus on danger within the past and what could be out of date in the present and being acted out in the present as well. We also have to explore actually um, the importance of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, and actually, sometimes we can um, 
Sometimes I read reports um, where we can set families up to fail because we give them a thousand and ten things to do, but they haven't got the practical resources to maybe do them. Um, for example, you know, do mindfulness in the house. Well, if they haven't got the basics of, I don't know, appropriate housing or you know, water, then actually getting somebody to do mindfulness is going to be a waste of time. Um, so we really emphasize the importance of actually having a hierarchy of needs for children and families as well. Another example would be to explore um, relationships and sexuality within individuals and the family as well. So thinking about how children and families might relate to you, relating to each other, and the key of observations that you might use in, in, in your assessments as well. So really the three chapters put in a real tangible toolkit for any practitioner from any background to use to hopefully put, um, plan um, and coordinate a lot of the work that we know can become tricky at times as well. But most importantly, taking time um, to look after yourself and others that you might be working with as well. Thank you. I'm now going to hand over to Ezra. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Sati. Uh, so I actually grew up and uh, qualified in Malaysia, Papua Asia. As you may have noticed that uh, we have uh, people from three different continents uh, who live and work in different continents, but now working and living in UK. So I, I started off uh, training in general adult psychiatry and then came over to Britain to 25 years ago to proceed to further training and doctoral research in perinatal infant mental health, uh, linking to attachment and psychopathology, and then uh, uh, further on in doing a second specialty in child adult psychiatry. Uh, while working as a consultant in the NHS, I was uh, privileged and uh, was very uh, great, uh, hap very happy to be awarded a strategic health authority grant. And therefore, with this grant, I managed to go for the attachment and psychopathology training where I met with uh, Lydia. So things happened in such a, quite a serendipity, ser serendipitous way uh, that enabled us to write this book. And here we are looking into a book that uh, talk not about not just about the content, but the process, which is equally important. So I'm going to the part three of this book. Uh, I shall be looking into how we develop these case studies as well as how we hope that these parts, parts of this book will be useful and uh, uh, user-friendly for readers. So in other words, uh, these cases that we have in incorporated in this book are actually actual cases that we have anonymized and amalgamated case examples. And we have ensured that we have consistently adapted an approach that is fundamentally biopsychosocial, uh, but as well as uh, embedding holistic, integrative, and family systemic perspectives in our formulation and uh, interventions. So we hope that um, this would be useful in terms of uh, enabling ourselves to think through using th what, uh, reading through the lens of dynamic maturation model for adaptation and attachment. And, and analyze the current and past dangers as how all survival strategies may be harmful or less adaptive in a new context. And we hope that uh, we could also equip the reader with ideas and tools in generalizing to real life cases. For instance, exercise at the end of each study called Bells That Rang would enable uh, the reader to uh, reflect upon the cases and then think about their current caseload and see how they could uh, pass on the, the learning amongst their team members as well as seeing how they could enhance their practice further. So in other words, we hope to promote the understanding and facilitate the professionals to engage with each indiv individual in the family in a compassionate manner where each of their perspective is valued, where parents and non-family members are encouraged to work together towards a positive outcome for each of them. Next slide, please, Clark. So I'll be talking about one particular case study. We have 12 case studies, but we have chosen this case study nine, uh, about 16-year-old Asha, who was coping with complex trauma and unresolved grief. So uh, if you look at this illustration here, she's standing by uh, the platform of a train, having voices that uh, were directly three in nature, asking her to hurt herself. And she too have been having a fair bit of physical symptoms without any organic or physiological basis because of the trauma she has been through that has not been resolved yet. Next slide, please, Club. Club. Right, so the background is such that uh, she's a second-generation immigrant from uh, Somalia. 
that has been sexually abused by a, a, uh, an uncle, of a relative who visited the family when she was six without others knowing about that. So you can see from the illustration here, she presented herself as refusing to wash and change in the night clothes, uh, refusing to eat her dinner. And you can see in the background, one of them, uh, uh, you can see a man sitting by, by the, the chair and he's a father. So Aisha actually informed that because uh, he was her attachment figure. But unfortunately, because of his own background, uh, he felt very guilty and blamed himself. And unfortunately, he died from taking a medication overdose. So he died of a suicide. And he was also intoxicated with alcohol, which is much a, a taboo in his culture. So Aisha wasn't aware of the reason and she blamed herself for what happened. But uh, later on, when she was six, so let's look at the function of self-protective behavior here. There are feelings of fear, 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 feeling of injustice and shame. And she felt very trapped and frustrated that she couldn't speak out. She couldn't believe that other people uh, would take her as telling the truth. So, and she disclosed that to dad, but dad didn't know how to manage it properly. Unfortunately, he too died. And there was a superstitious belief that whoever she comes close to and disclosing her, her difficulty would be would not have a good outcome. And she felt pretty trapped in that regard. So she was behaving in a very uncooperative and difficult manner because adults just couldn't understand her, especially her mother, uh, why she would be behaving in that way. And she therefore understandably feel that the world is a very scary place with no safety, no comfort. Uh, next slide, please, Clark. So uh, this is a function of a self-protective behavior. And then when she reached uh, age of 11, by then mom it was about four years, yeah, uh, four or five years after uh, dad has died and mom has remarried her second cousin and uh, therefore the second child, uh, Zahra, who unfortunately had a life-limiting disability, uh, spinal muscular atrophy. So obviously a lot of attention by stepdad and mom has gone to support Zahra. And in many ways, uh, Aisha felt uh, neglected and un 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 unable and felt ignored by her parents. And she actually, she started quite well in school initially, especially first year of a secondary school. Uh, but unfortunately, she was uh, bullied by some girls in the school and she had to move to another school. And then at age 12, she developed painful periods uh, which she, she didn't feel supported by her mother and she felt very much on her own having to go through this pain. And because it's also abdominal pain which dad had, she felt that uh, she too would die at some, at some stage too, just like her dad. So a fair bit of uh, flashbacks of the abuse were associated with the pain and she, she misinterpreted the cues that her peers in school were trying to either be friendly or trying to, to isolate her and isolate her. And as a result, she isolated herself and began to gravitate towards older men. So she then began to be very vulnerable and started risk-taking behavior, like uh, staying away from home. And all through, through all, all these occurrences, mom was not aware of what happened and neither could she disclose it to anybody. Instead, she bottled up her feelings as she feels that the most reliable way to get uh, her parents and teachers' approval. She feels unsafe to confide with people. She felt very guilty with lots of fears. And at the same time, she too craved comfort and acceptance from other people, initially with the teachers and uh, her parents. But as she grows older, she began to look for people outside of the family. That's when she became quite uh, challenging in that regard that she was in a dilemma. Next slide, please, Club. So what is the DMM formulation here? Based on the DMM classification, Asha's strategy is understood to be depressed with unresolved trauma due to complex, uh, with a complex form because of sexual abuse and bullying. So, and she's also psychologically unresolved because of unresolved way in a preoccupying way about the death of her father. So she's depressed 
at the same level, she recognizes that her coping strategies are failing. Her overall strategy is compulsively promiscuous, which is A5, which is a very extreme form of uh, the A strategy, as well as self-reliant. And she uses the strategy of promiscuity because while she needs other people for safety and comfort, she feels safer when her contact with other people is superficial because closeness in the experience leads to danger. Her self-reliance strategy is useful because it means she doesn't have to depend on others or show vulnerability within the context of relationships. Again, this feels safer for Aisha because of her experience of predictable danger when she gets close to people. Then we have these intrusions of forbidden negative effect in the forms of hallucinations and impulsive behavior. Because we could understand psychosis, the voices that you hear are perhaps echoes of the critical voices she's experienced in her life from her parents and from her abusive uncle. The voices reflect and amplify the belief that Aisha has about herself for being dirty, shameful, guilty and responsible for her own abuse, as well as for her father's death. She feels she deserves to be punished and the voices in her head are amplifying this. So another way to understanding the function of psychosis is that the level of fears and self-attacking voices drove Aisha to put herself in highly risky situations like assisting with uh, dangerous people. However, later on when uh, she developed depression and she was pushed to the most extreme moments of vulnerability, she can no longer put on a brave face and comply instead to and feel that the, the experience of uncontained intense emotion that forced her to essential protective services into action. And next slide, please, Clark. So she then therefore was uh, admitted to voluntarily to inpatient psychiatric adolescent unit where she stayed for 12 weeks and received uh, the appropriate care, especially medications, but also individual trauma focus and systemic family therapies with opportunities to begin addressing the grief alongside uh, with, uh, compassionate therapies uh, with alongside uh, with uh, an atmosphere and 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 the uh, un with unconditional love and acceptance. So we could look at this last illustration here. That now Aisha's mother and stepfather understands Aisha's struggles with cultural identity and the burdens and secrets she has been carrying all these years. With support from the therapist, mom has also spoken with Aisha about that suicide, and they both grieve together. Aisha's stepmother has also realized this importance. And Aisha has developed a new future, a new hope for the future. So one evening, she brings home a prospectus from a local college and reads through the course options with the stepfather while her mother feeds Sarah at the other end of the table. You can see from this illustration here that we have uh, this reconstituted family able to move on. So this is the kind of hopeful outcome we hope to establish through this way of uh, working together. Thank you. Over to you, Clark, please. Okay, well, thank you very much, Ezra. And I think uh, the case study of Asha really does highlight this family systemic approach that is common to all of the case studies in the book. So I'm going to <clears throat> do the last eight or so minutes here, and then we'll take questions from the people attending. Uh, through the chat function. And I'm going to give a bit of an overview of the case studies. Uh, Ezra mentioned that there are 12 in all, and we were just looking in detail at one. I'll give you a quick overview of the kind of ground that we cover with the case studies and um, uh, why we chose the ones that we did. And then I'm going to give you a very quick overview of the whole book so you get a sense of uh, the, the piece as a whole. So here, here's a quick list of our 12 case studies. Um, and uh, uh, just to point out to you that we had a lot of very searching discussions as a group of four authors about what ages they should be, uh, what genders, uh, the kinds of issues they should be facing, uh, cultural, racial backgrounds, etc. And with only 12 uh, case studies, we could only cover so much. But one thing that we did want to do is to base them all in our client work. So as Ezra mentioned, they are amal amalgams uh, to some extent, and obviously they're anonymized, but they are all drawn from our uh, case experience working with individuals and families. <clears throat> A very handy guide that uh, Lydia took the lead on uh, at the start of part three of the book is to give you a very quick reference table 
about those 12 case studies. So here are the 12 case studies down the left-hand side. And here are the themes and the dangers that were present in the family context or the environment, including up to three generations of the family. So if you're working in a family context, and this is a really central uh, theme within the DMM, when you're taking a family systemic approach, is you're trying to find out where's the danger in this family that this family is oriented around. And one of the brilliant insights that Crittenden uh, and colleagues have helped us to understand through the DMM is that the danger might not actually be in the room. The danger might be something that the parent themselves experienced in their own childhood, or the danger might have been experienced by that parent's parent. Or we could even go further back for those of you who study transgenerational trauma. Uh, and so how do these traumas get passed down? And so uh, when we're doing a, a full family systemic uh, analysis, we're really trying to address where is the danger? Is it, is it uh, past or present? Uh, and then we can see across the top there, we see uh, perinatal issues, uh, parental mental health issues, et cetera, going across. And so depending on your own client group, this is a very quick reference table as to where you might see some themes that resonate with your own client group to, to give you a case study that you and perhaps your, your colleagues could look through the case study uh, about. And it might give you some helpful hints as to what approaches might be useful with your clients. Uh, we have a following table. Uh, this is more specific to the individual who's featured in the case study. So these would be themes and dangers that are present in the child or the young person's behavior or personal history. And so again, we have all 12 case studies running down the left-hand side. And then across the top, we have the, the main themes that we address in the book. One thing you'll probably notice that really shouts out is those uh, middle columns there, one for violence, including sexual violence, and the other for trauma and loss. Trauma and loss is present in each of the case studies. And um, just in terms of my own process as a a co-author, when I saw this result come back, so to speak, from Lydia's analysis, and uh, I thought, well, yeah, actually, that makes a lot of sense. We didn't intend it at the outset for that theme of tra unresolved trauma and loss to be present in every case study, but these are serious issues of people, uh, people's uh, psychological struggles, relationship struggles, etc., and it shouldn't come as a surprise to us that that kind of goes hand in hand with some really significant unresolved trauma and loss. So if we're thinking about the roots of psychological disorder dysfunction, this, uh, this uh, aspect of the case studies uh, fits, fits the research uh, very, uh, very exactly. So this just gives you, I've, I've got a few slides here that are essentially the first slides from the various case studies. Um, Amelie's a, a young mom, and she's there are uh, big problems here with her 18 month old infant, and she also is coping with severe depression. Uh, Lucas is 14, and uh, he has uh, problematic sexual behavior, and he's in a residential setting uh, going through treatment. Uh, we also take a family systemic approach with him. Uh, Jacob is a case of adoption breakdown, he's age eight. Uh, lots of unresolved trauma from very early in his life, lots of work done uh, with his parents together in their relationship and also individual counseling for his adoptive parents. And you see there at the lower right, uh, something around the intervention where both parents are uh, helped individually and as a couple, and dad is helped to recognize his role as being a central part of Jacob's life. Ja Dad had up to that point kind of been absenting himself with long distance lorry driving and he gets back into the picture as part of the intervention. Azim is age 14. Uh, this is a, uh, a, I think a very pertinent case study. Azim is an immigrant from uh, Afghanistan uh, trying to find safety in a new country. He deals with severe guilt about the fact that his brother died on the journey over and he was responsible for his brother and uh, various forms of intervention go on there. Uh, that was one of Lydia's case studies and I, I it's, it's one of my absolute favorites in the book. 
uh, just wanted to say how much I, uh, I enjoyed being a part of, uh, you know, the back and forth around the dialogue of development of that case study. Uh, Suchita, uh, who has uh, physical difficulties of different, different types, as well as being a, a wheelchair user, and the big issue there is, is uh, the family issue. How can she grow and become a young woman who wants to express her independence? And how can the team of professionals help her family to help adjust to the idea that uh, their, their daughter is, is growing up? She's no longer the little child who was utterly dependent on them. And she wants to uh, become more independent. Rob is age 20 and he's in institutional care and he has uh, learning disabilities and also he's coping with very strong feelings. And uh, so we have a case study built around how do we help the team of professionals as well as his family members to help Rob as he grows into adulthood. Uh, Jessica is age 14. She's been living in the streets, a uh, very traumatic history and she's helped in uh, family systemic ways with uh, some therapeutic foster carers Gretchen is age seven with a huge amount of complex trauma. And uh, she's given some really uh, quite detailed and extensive help by a therapeutic team and also is helped uh, by the, the broader family system through kinship care. This slide here just gives you a sense of the common structure to all of the case studies. Um, they start with an introduction, then they give background, they look at several milestones in the person's development. Uh, at each milestone, we talk about the function of the behavior. This is so crucial to the DMM approach that we don't try and categorize symptoms or label symptoms, that we try to understand the function, the underlying function or meaning of people's behavior. Then we do the assessment and the family systemic formulation, as we've been talking about, and then the intervention, which is typically uh, family systemic or at the very least professional systemic. And then we talk about the outcomes and the bells that rang for you as the reader, as Ezra mentioned earlier. We have the ASHA case study. Then we have another case study of a mother trying to connect with her young daughter. And then for those of you who know the adults book, we have a reprise of the case studies of Beth and Callum. So for those of you who've gotten to know Beth and Callum very well over the years, you'll see that we bring them back in and then we actually look at other features of their story. Uh, Beth, we, uh, Beth, who's at age 38 in the adults book, we meet her at age 15 and we go into quite a lot of detail of her depression and how that is addressed within the school system and within the family. And then Callum at age 20, his girlfriend, you might recall, is pregnant, and we journey forward in time with the two of them for the first year or two after the baby is born. Um, uh, Sati did a, a brilliant job taking us through uh, chapters four, five, and six, and I just wanted to point out by giving you a snapshot here of the table of contents that we do give a, a good amount of attention to the DMM itself in the early chapters, here, uh, chapter two, for example, we talk about the ABC strategies. And then in chapter three, we give an overview of the DMM model itself. Um, and the introduction in chapter one also introduce a cha uh, attachment theory more broadly. And then uh, this is really just there for the sake of completion. Uh, chapters uh, six, seven, and eight uh, were addressed parsley by uh, Sati. We give a good amount of attention in chapter seven to the three different types of the B strategy, in particular the earned B. Uh, for the, so for those of you who are interested in resilience and resilience theory, that earned B section is gonna be really relevant to you. And chapter eight is essentially a reprise of the, um, the learn model. Uh, that's very, uh, it, uh, it's, it's very similar to the chapter in the adults book. And then this is uh, the last slide we'll show you today. This is about how you can order the book at a 15% discount. Uh, that's a time limited discount just until the 8th of August. And we'll be sending all of these slides to the DMM community. So uh, you'll get this and essentially go to the pavilion site. You can just click on this link here uh, when you get the PDF of the slides. And then if you put in this little code ABP15 when it asks you for the coupon, 
um, that will get you your order. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing now. So Alex, would you, can I hand over to you and uh, we could perhaps facilitate some questions into the chat and that sort of thing. Absolutely. So I have had some questions sent to me directly, so I'll proceed with those. Okay, well, thank you all for such an interesting talk and introduction to the book. So the first question, I guess is towards Clark, but I think everybody can answer this, which is, are there any stories about how the first book was received in anticipation for the impact this follow-up book might make? Um, well, I suppose I, I could take that one. Um, the, uh, uh, Tony and I, very, very similar to the approach that we four authors took with this book, Tony and I uh, really wanted the, the adults book to be a user-friendly introduction to attachment theory and the, even more specifically the DMM. Uh, and so the five case studies in that book uh, followed a very similar pattern to the one that we chose for this book. And we, uh, we stuck with that format because um, we got such great feedback from the adults book. Uh, I heard stories, for example, of, of teams within social care, within mental health services uh, would be typical examples. Uh, also in probation services where teams would have a series of team discussions around uh, the case studies in the book. And I knew from lots of feedback on the uh, uh, people who had attended training courses, but just also people that I would hear from out of the blue, so to speak, who would talk about how the book was their steady reference guide for their clients and inter um, the interviewing guide, for example, being something that people keep sort of on the desk near to their, near, near, near for ease, ease of reference. So that gave us some good evidence that the, uh, the intention was borne out in the, in the actual way that the book was used. And we very much followed that lead when we came to develop this book. I don't know if Lydia or Sati or Ezra would like to add a thought to that. Um, thanks, Clark. I, I, I'm conscious of time and that there might be lots of questions waiting. I, I think I, I've had the privilege of running many, many training sessions with groups based on the Attachment Based Practice with Adults book, hereby known as the Blue Book. Um, uh, and and, and for, I've, I've had very reliable feedback from many, many training groups that it's accessible, user-friendly, and helps them to understand this often overused but underdefined concept of attachment theory and how to put it on its feet in their work with individuals and families. So that's the feedback I've had. And I, I very much hope that, that's, that, we, that we receive, sim that this green book is received in very similar ways. That's certainly our intention. Fantastic, I'll move on. So two questions have come in, which I think are similar, which is one, do you cover the topic of supervision in the book? And then following on from that, um, is there discussion about the self-protective strategies that we as clinicians use and do you consider in the book how the function of those strategies may play a role in the work we do and the growth and development of our clients? Uh, yes um, oh my goodness that was a two-part question and my head only remembered the second part so uh, I'll, I'll address that second part is oh the first one was about supervision yeah um, so we don't have a specific chapter on supervision Although to some extent we do address that question when we talk about the principles of DMM informed treatment. Uh, we do have a, a chapter on supervision in the adults book. And for that reason, we partly didn't also include that in this uh, new book uh, because when we, when we weighed things up against what do we want to include, what can we give less priority to, we wanted to give a more diverse uh, case studies. So 12 case studies meant we had to drop some things and supervision was, was, was that. As to the uh, dispositional representations of the workers, uh, yeah, again, that would be very central, I think, to the principles of DMM informed treatment, where, uh, which we do cover in, in some of the early chapters. The idea that as workers, the more we learn about attachment, the more we learn about the DMM, uh, the more informed we can be about our own histories and our own attachment strategies and styles, and also what activates us in the clinical space, so to speak. 
and that gives us some very useful information for then being able to identify it when it's happening and also to compensate for that. I'd, I'd love to draw any of the co-authors in on that one too. I guess for myself, when, when I read um, some of the chapters, there's, you can't read the book without actually paying attention to yourself because there's so much stuff around self-reflection, like self-reflection, mentalizing, thinking about your own emotional hooks. But really drawing upon your own um, experiences, maybe as a child, as a young person, or even as an adult as well, and really paying attention to actually um, the importance of relational spaces and what you're really trying to pull out when you're assessing and formulating, and yourself being part of that formulation as well. I don't know whether, um, Ezra, you've got anything to add in there. Yes, I think because it's relational based, as well as the attachment focus, so. I think it actually dawns upon us as we write this book that uh, one goal cannot go without the other. So the supervision oftentimes is not just uh, regarded as a one-way traffic, but it should be systemic in nature too, uh, whereby uh, the, the, actually it's not just two person meeting up in that way, but actually it also draws upon their, their own experiences of being uh, supervised in the past and what they're bringing together in mentalizing, thinking through the issues and the contextual factors are involved as well. So I think this book will be really suitable when used together in groups or even one-to-one -one supervision setting and seeing how uh, we would have some, how our own self-protective protective, uh, 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 strategies will become brought to the fore when we actually begin to, to, to reflect on these cases. Yes, certainly a very good resource for supervision. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so the next question is, um, for many of us who've tried to use a DMM in our practice, we sometimes face barriers in the organisations we're part of. Do you have tips for how both perhaps a lone clinician working using the DMM all the way through to a whole team trying to apply it, how they can make use of this book? Uh Lydia, I'd, I'd love to draw you in on this question because I, I know that you deal with this almost every day in your in your clinical work, don't you? Yeah, I do. Thank you, Clark. Um, I, I work as a systemic psychotherapist in a CAM setting with children and adolescents with moderate to severe mental health problems and their families. Um, and I would say that the DMM is one of the lenses that I draw on most frequently in my work. Um, and... Uh, I don't work in an organization that would ever describe itself as DMM informed. Um, I, I would say that I use it in, in several different ways. One is to reflect on my own responses. So which, which echoes back to the previous great questions that we were asked. So noticing uh, where, when my, what represents danger to me in clinical practice and in thinking about clinical practice. Uh, thinking about what might activate my attachment strategies, thinking whether I'm drawn towards cognitive or affective information, thinking about what I want to uh, avoid, thinking about young people who I want to champion uh, and fight for. So thinking about when my ANC strategies get activated yeah. by work with young people. Um, so I use it within within myself. I also use it when I'm when I'm having conversations with colleagues about formulation. Mm. So I use DMM concepts and ideas without necessarily labeling them. Although it's not secretive. If someone asks me, where's that from? Then I'll always talk about it. It's not that it's under the table. Um, and yeah. certainly I've found that colleagues who would say that they use attachment theory um, have found it really useful to think about information processing, which the DMM elaborates so comprehensively. Yeah. So thinking about cognitive and affective information and, and how, how we use that. Um, I also use it with families. So this I, I, I've, I've developed ways of, of, of using the DMM to help me explain attachment in non-pathologizing, non-blaming ways with families themselves. Um, in particular, these concepts of it being dynamic, that it's, it's not set in stone right up until the end of life, we can adapt new uh, attachment strategies and the idea that it's maturational. What, what are people's capacities mm. at different points in time? What's age appropriate? appropriate? So I, I would say that 
sure, I, I would love to sign up to work for an organization that, that cites the DMM as an underpinning principle, but there aren't that many of those around yet, I say yet. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm certainly able to use it in the ways that I've elaborated within myself, in my clinical work and with colleagues. Yeah, well, Ezra uh, and, I, and Asati, I saw you both nodding as, as Lydia was talking. I was wondering if you wanted to, uh, to come in there. Nothing for myself, I think, Lydia, thank you. Yes, it's just a few words on that. I think it's very interesting to think about that, especially now at the time where resources are so scarce and uh, a, lot of, a lot of challenges to funding, especially state-funded uh, uh, health services. And we need to really see where people are in terms of what are we advocating. In the sense, people are not just fighting their corners, but actually advocating for our stakeholders. How, at the end of the day, we shouldn't lose the fact that our clients, the child or the family are actually, uh, shouldn't be lost in the whole picture as we argue for resources. So yeah, information processing as well as knowing uh, the strategies people have. And of course, the kind of uh, things that uh, drive, drive and motivate them. Uh, yes, I think this would be very much so in terms of how we could bring these things to the table and actually be able to, to have a good conversations around that. Thank you. The, uh, uh, in rereading Avery's uh, question in the chat, um, I'm also picking up a different aspect of your question that perhaps we didn't uh, uh, quite capture. It's the, 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 uh, what's the function of the clinician's protective strategies playing a role in the client's growth and development? And uh, one, of the, one of the things uh, that I've talked about in, in trainings on this is people often get uh, uh, quite animated about the question of, if I'm working with somebody who uses a strategy, how does my approach need to differ if I'm working with somebody who's using the C strategy? And that's a very fine question to ask. However, if you're not doing the full and comprehensive assessments, you're only ever gonna be making best guesses uh, to what the strategy is. So the good news is that earned B practice is going to be the answer, uh, or at least uh, part of the answer. So when you're talking about how well the clinician knows themselves, knows their own strategies, has a uh, accurate self-perception about their own history and history of attachment strategies and how they function in the clinical space with the client. Uh, they can serve as, well, we might think of it as a role model. Uh, we might think of it as an accurate mirror, uh, an instrument to assist self-regulation processes an instrument for encouraging reflection. And all of that's going to emerge through earned B practice. And what I have often said to people on training events is that no matter what your tendencies as a person in your own life, whether you're slightly or a little more than slightly A-ish or C-ish, when you're in the clinical space, you've got to be the earned B practitioner. And then when your clinical day is done, you can go back to your slightly A-ish or C-ish tendencies, whatever that might be. Uh, so I. Uh, Avery, that came to mind when I was reading your question. Um, so I have another question then mm -hmm. for the group. So what barriers might families face when trying to shift to more of a DMM style of thought about the, the challenges they face? Wow, I, I have some thoughts. Should I start and then we'll yeah. see who else wants to contribute? Um, where... Where, drawing on my clinical practice with families, sometimes there is a search for a simple answer, um, that families face such distress and complexity, um, uh, feel, can feel exhausted by coping with, with the difficulties they're facing, and they are keen to find a simple answer, uh, which is sometimes a medication-based answer, uh, mm -hmm. sometimes a, a behavioral, you know, a, a behavioral practice, um, which will, in inverted commas, fix their child. Um, and the, the DMM by necessity uh, does not promote these simple answers. Um, it's very focused mm -hmm. on reflexive relational patterns, um, both as causes of and maintaining factors for and therefore solutions for uh, complex behaviours and emotional distress. Um, so I, I think that helping families to 
uh, be calm and grounded and safe enough, contained enough to hear and to begin to consider complex causality and therefore complex solutions um, can, is, is, is a real challenge. Um, and and for, to my mind, that's why um, we place so much focus on relationship-based practice. How do we as practitioners bring ourselves to this work, sit alongside families and young people, um, support them to feel contained enough to, um, uh, to, to begin to be open to complex causation and therefore complex plans and solutions um, that aren't in any way blaming. Um, so that, that, would be, that would be my penny's worth. Uh, how about others? Who, what would you like to add, folks? I think for myself and my clinical experience, sometimes the barriers can be the system itself. Mm. That we don't have the time, commitment, or the longevity that, that's needed for children and families because of cuts, resources, staffing, and all the wider things that we know can do more harm. Mm. Um, you know, so mental health services, you know, nationally, we hear things about time-limited treatments, um, you know, fast-tracked assessments, all you know, assessments that aren't sound or robust enough to really make sense of children and the difficulties. So another layer to that maybe would be actually systemic stuff um, that we all experience um, as yeah. well. That's a really good point. It's not only families who want simple solutions yeah. and simple answers sometimes, it's, it's the professional systems too. Yeah, it's a great point. I think the model we bring forth is not really rocket science. And uh, of course, we understand that when when families have a lot of trauma that has not been resolved and they come with a fair bit of dangerous, high risk taking behavior, it would be beneficial for them to be scaffolded in some ways uh, before we address further. But yes, I think uh, as a diagnostician and a medic, oftentimes the categories of diagnosis doesn't help. Uh, and of, of course, a lot of these diagnoses are based on symptoms without going beyond to understand the functions uh, and the purpose of this behavior. So I think we need to have that kind of support for, for families. We are not talking about spending a lot of money, but actually a lot of common sense are involved here. Uh, so the, I think Sati, the pathway you are actually managing talks about that, how we can move people beyond just diagnosis to actually, and not just symptoms, but actually looking into understanding what they're going through, making sense of what is happening. Fantastic. Just a couple more questions and then we'll draw to a close. Can these ideas be applied to associated disciplines? So for example, within the education sector? Um, yes, I've, I've, yes. Done, I've done uh, uh, dozens and dozens of trainings for teachers during inset days, uh, in a three hour introduction to attachment theory, the DMM. Uh, I don't necessarily show the full circumplex model. I might just show the triangle behavior pattern function we can get 90% of the way there with models like this. And the most common feedback I get uh, after training events like that is, well, every teacher should be taught this model uh, because when it's taught right, the DMM is actually a very common sense and user-friendly model. It can get very complex very quickly once we get into the, the subtleties of it, but uh, to be a, a, a practically useful uh, I think we can get many of the, the most important ideas across within one to three hours uh, on an inset day. So I'll speak from personal experience as a trainer there. Um, uh, would anyone else like to comment on that? Sure, I've done consultation and tra training days to teachers, just to think about attachment in the classroom, but also attachments within staff teams as well um, and working with all the pressures that teachers are under at the moment as well. So we'll supervise the spaces for teachers um, within um, school settings. Hmm. Okay, so I have two more questions now. So the first is, um, are you planning on incorporating this into the training that you do? And will people be able to come along and learn about this in more detail from each of you all together? Well, we have a live and in-person launch being planned for, um, oh my goodness, I should have the date to hand. Uh, October 19th, yeah. October thank 19th. you, Ezra. October 19th in Birmingham at the Midlands Arts Center. So we have an all-day event. But uh, 
we're, we're all trainers. So either together or in twos or threes or in, in ones, we'll be doing that. And we also have a wonderful group of associated trainers uh, who do training uh, based on the adults book. And uh, you know, over time, we have no doubt that that, will, uh, that that pool of trainers will incorporate that. So we're just at the very start of that, but I can assure you, yes, it will uh, form part of the training. Uh, as we go forward. And then the final question is, we've written about adults, you've written about families, children, adolescents. Um, what's next? Uh, funnily enough, I was having this conversation with Pavilion Publishers the other day. Uh, of course, as soon as we announced to some of our colleagues that we're doing a book called Attachment-Based Practice with Children, Adolescents and Families, one of my colleagues in the DMM community said, oh, can you do one on infancy? So, okay, all right, there's that one. And then Pavilion said, well, we've got a lot of requests for uh, serious cases, forensic cases. Can you do that one? So yeah, part three, part four, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna stay busy for a while. Uh, have you got an idea? Did you want one? <laughs> well, I thought with Lydia's expertise, older adults would seem to be appropriate. Okay. You, you, you do understand that each of these books, based on our track record, takes about five years. So <laughs> yeah. um, you're, you, you, you're, you're filling up our um, <clears throat> to-do list very quickly there. Well, I think based on the feedback, it seems very important that they're written and that more are written in the future too. So keep working. Mm. Thank you so much to each of you. It's, um, well, I haven't read the new one, but the old book is such an incredibly useful and inspirational book that I'm certain this one is too and anybody who hasn't read the old one ought to and should therefore probably get the new one too so thank you so much